we're going to, as a review, we're going to start with 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to start reading at chapter 1, verse 9, and read to the end of that passage. And through verse 4 of chapter 2, uh, where we left off last week. Um, before we do, I want to continue to implore and encourage you to be taking time during the week to be reading uh, this book, all right? Reading the verses, rereading the verses that we've gone over, reading from this chapter, and not waiting until Sunday morning and not having it only be Sunday morning that you're looking at the material, but to be reading over it and reviewing what we've gone over the week before so that the Holy Spirit can have another opportunity to weave these truths in and through your life and to kind of grow them and nurture them through your life. And also as an opportunity to be doing that fellowship, that abiding, that active abiding with Christ that Paul talks about uh, in the New Testament. Um, in fact, Tracy, if you would come up, I've asked Tracy to come up and talk to us a little bit about what it can look like to be reading and studying during the week. What's involved in that? What's involved in abiding? I'll just ask her to share a little bit. Come on up. Question, follow-up question. Here, I'll give you the mic since I'm on. That way it won't sound so different. So, is it on there? All right. So, some, of that, some of that can get to be to a place of, of kind of like what you said. It can, it can seem to look like works, all right? Uh, or it can seem to be kind of separatist during the day. For instance, okay, now I'm going to sit down and have my devotions. Okay, now my devotions are done. Now I need to go on with my day. So what are some, is that what it looks like? Or what are, what are some more ways that, that we can kind of work to combine to understand that the fellowship, devotion is part of fellowship, but abiding with Christ is something that goes on throughout the day? Um, 
But one of the things is looking for opportunities to apply what you've read during the day, throughout the day. Um, one of the things that comes to mind easily for me because of Adam is that he gets into something and I need to correct him or talk to him or teach him. And then I start, well, Adam, you know what the Bible says? It says this. And starting to apply, this is what the answer is to every question that you have that is related to spiritual things. This is the answer to the questions that come up about behavior, about how to teach and train your child. And so when we're going through training and teaching him, you know, Adam, you need to obey mommy. When I tell you to do something, you need to obey because the Bible says that's important. And if you learn to obey me, you'll learn to obey God. And that's what's important because God has the best plan for you. Um, so it's, it's learning how to apply it in situations throughout the course of your day and not just, okay, I've, I've checked it off my list of tasks to do today. But then it's also great for encouraging other people. You come across people all day long, even if you don't leave the house, you know, interactions on the phone, interactions via email, things that you can encourage people on. You're like, hey, Becky, I know that you know, one of your many relatives is in the hospital or is sick, and how's that going today? And I just want to encourage you, you know, that throughout this day, remember that God is with you always, and he, he's looking down on you, and he's caring about you, and he, you know, you're finding ways to encourage other people with that as well. So it's, it's meant to not be just set aside for those 20 minutes or that hour each morning. And, and also to be praying and interacting with God throughout the day, you know. Hey, God, thanks for letting us go over to Angeline George's on Friday night. It was great, and, you know, I, she just was really great. And just help her, you know, be able to come to church today and help me be able to see her and talk to her and um, just different things. Or, you know, like I know that Eve is going through a hard time, and, you know, as I think about her in the hospital, praying for her and praying some scriptures that I might have studied through the day. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm glad she touched on a point of Adam that reminded me, too, that our our, one thing that we're trying to get in and kind of ingrained in Adam's mind is that idea that, I mean, our relationship with him is secure. I mean, he's our son, right? He was born into our family, and so that relationship is there. Just like when we're born into our relationship with Jesus Christ by believing on him as our savior, that relationship begins and it never ends. That's the relationship part. But that fellowship when Adam is obedient to us and when he, chooses to, when he chooses to obey and he values that relationship that we have enough that it compels him to desire to walk in obedience with us, that we have fellowship, that fellowship with him is sweeter. And so we're trying as we, as we encourage him in the obedience, in the obedience part, we're encouraging him and saying things like, wow, Adam, that's great. It's so, it's so pleasant. It's so much more joyful when you're obedient because it helps our fellowship. And so in doing that, then, as he starts growing and when he starts putting two and two together, wow, you know, now, now I've entered into a relationship with Christ because I believe on him as my Savior, with God the Father. Now I'm his son. And now this is what it means to be in fellowship with him, to be fellowshipping, listening for him watching, um, you know, reading about these different people in the Bible and understanding these concepts of Scripture and obeying him and demonstrating my love for him out of obedience. Obedience is not something that can produce salvation. It's only something that can, um, that can come as a result of our walking in the Holy Spirit after we've already entered that relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, well, let's open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. We're going to read through chapter 2, verse 4. For they themselves, people not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after, even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit, but we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Even so we speak. Uh, hold on here, friends. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts.
So in this part of Paul's letter to the young Thessalonian believers, he was addressing some of the slanderous accusations that the Thessalonians, the unbelieving neighbors, were gossiping about. Right? These are things we talked about. We learned last week that Paul was not doing so out of some kind of a concern for his own personal reputation. It wasn't because he was um, trying to get recognized so much by the people or try to get some kind of attention drawn to himself personally, but because he recognized how harmful it would be for the young believers if they were enticed and drawn away. Okay? If these young believers, these young Thessalonian believers, because they had only known the Lord for about six months, and he recognized how, how, how concerning it would be if these young believers would somehow be enticed and drawn away from their focus on Christ, drawn away to the unbelievers who were spreading these issues of gossip, and even in some ways concerned that they might be drawn away possibly back into even idol worship, idolatry. In other words, if these slanderous neighbors, okay, if these slanderous and gossiping neighbors, the unbelievers that still existed around Thessalonica, if they could convince these new believers, this new church in Thessalonica that was only six months old, very vibrant, growing in the Lord, if these unbelievers could convince them that Paul and Timothy and Silas came to them as missionaries out of place of their own personal deception or their own personal gain or their own personal manipulation, if they could convince them of that, then they might be able to go a step further and start planting these seeds of doubt, starting to convince the believers that, hmm, oh, maybe the message that they brought too was wrong. Right? Maybe what you believe is real and oh, maybe that's wrong too. So this was a critical, a, of grave concern to Paul, Timothy, and Silas, thus uh, him writing about this. In doing so, we also discussed how Paul asserted a few basic truths about Silas and Timothy's three-week stay with the Thessalonians six months ago, first Thessalonians, uh, six months ago. It had been obvious to the Thessalonians uh, because of the power demonstrated by the Holy Spirit it had been obvious because of the reality in which the Thessalonians came to believe on Jesus Christ. These are the two reasons why it was so obvious, uh, this relationship with Christ that they knew they had entered into um, by believing on him as their, son, as their savior. Two of these reasons why it was so obvious to the Thessalonians that the missionaries were so directly sent to them, um, that the missionaries coming to them was not in vain. Right? It was very intentional and purposeful that it was even after suffering an extraordinary amount of persecution, that term, remember, was thlipsis, T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S, thlipsis, which, which meant a very strong, not just outward persecution, but also kind of inward turmoil, an in, a very strong and intense amount of persecution. And even after that, you know, Paul, and Silas, and Timothy, had decided to come directly to the Thessalonians and start all over ministering to them. Right? They weren't believers when he came to them. So he decided even through that to come to them. Again, his visit was not in vain. It was not out of selfish motive. And that their teaching of the gospel was not from deceit, but that the gospel originated with God himself. God who specifically entrusted these men with presenting the gospel to the Thessalonians. They were entrusted by God to present this gospel. We talked about last week how they were entrusted, and yet they also were excited to do it. They understood the value of this gift of salvation that they had, and so naturally they wanted to share it. They knew the value of it. They knew the importance of it, and they wanted to communicate this with other men and women who never heard about the gospel of Christ. On today's message, among other points, we'll talk about, we'll see Paul continuing to remind the Thessalonian church of the character that he and Silas and Timothy demonstrated to them and that the character that they were with them during their three-week stay, using some more instances of phrases like, as ye know, and ye remember, and ye are witnesses, uh, trying to... Uh, pull out from the Thessalonians, the Thessalonian, the Thessalonian church, a kind of um, ownership, 
you know. Yeah, you know what, these, these, uh, these other, these unbelievers over here are telling us these rumors, but no, I remember, I remember how Paul and Silas were. They're saying this, but no, I, I rec now if I think about it, I do. I remember clearly how they behaved, and I know that that's a lie over here. I know these gossiping rumors are lies. Uh, Paul's also using a phrase that's God is witness. We'll talk about that a little bit, reflecting on the serious accountability that these missionaries valued from God and how it motivated them not to stray from what he had entrusted them uh, into some kind of fleshly pursuits. Let's continue on by reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. We won't get through all these verses today, but let's read these verses together. And this time I'm going to be reading from the King James. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are our witnesses, and God also. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his own children. Janice has agreed to come up. We're going to do a little bit of a skit up here. Thank you, Janice. This should, only, this should take about 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> now she does. Thank you. Yeah, you can go ahead and hold that. So, Janice, we have, uh, you know what, there, there's a need we have here at the church. We need somebody to clean all the windows every other day. Would you be interested in doing that for us? Not really. <laughs> no? Well, Janet, I, you know, you know what I heard about you? I heard that you, are, you know, at work, everybody's saying about how amazing you are at work. You know, not just, you know, and, you know, when we had that, when we were over, you know, at George and Anjali's house, you know, for, you know uh, I mean, it was, it was amazing, like, to see you helping out. I mean, just, it was amazing, you know? And uh, let me see, well, let me think of, you know, something else. Um, you know, just the, you always have this bright smile, and you're always doing, you know, these wonderful things. And I just, I think I could really see you doing something like washing the windows around the church. So, and would you, what do you think? Would you do? No. Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, Janice, um, you know, too, like this morning, I was just thinking about how, how wonderful you are with, with uh, children, you know, and how wonderful you are with um, older people, too, uh, with pretty much just everybody. And look, you speak different languages, you know, so I, how about it? Would you, would you do it? Would you do okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Janice. Thank you. That was on the fly. Janice only learned that she was, I asked her to do that this morning. So thank you, Janice. Flattering words. All right, verse 5 there, chapter 2, verse 5. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is our witness. How tempting it can be when we're trying to get our way in a situation to start using flattery. It can be really out there, or it can be more subtle. It's a very easy tendency or temptation to get into, to trying to 
mix our words or convey our thoughts toward a particular individual, using flattery, paying compliments. Um, and of course, compliments are good, and, and it's good to point out strengths in someone, but not from that kind of manipulative intent, not from a place of deception. Uh, looking around for opportunities specifically to offer praise and encouragement, um, not in order to showcase the Holy Spirit's work in someone's life, but in order to manipulate someone into doing what it is that you want them to do. Right? Or how about a cloak of covetousness? What does that mean? It's kind of like using one's position of service or a role like a pastor to place demands on other people around you. Right? Using this cloak, coming in under the guise of a position or a role or a responsibility. And while you have everyone's focus on that, meanwhile, trying to get all of your needs met by deceptive means underneath. It's like this cloak. You're using this cloak to cover up what your real intentions are. Right? That's a cloak of covetousness. Now, it's important for us, you know, talking about needs, it's important for us, and it's even vital for us as body, a body with many different parts, to share our needs openly with one another. It's important for us, uh, this is what a family does, it openly expresses its needs, and as a body, it seeks to respond to those needs, right? Galatians 6, 2, let's turn there for a minute. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It's a few books before the letter of Thessalonians. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. This is the first half of that verse. Bear ye one another's burdens. Right. It refers to the heavy and more unusual burdens that come up in our lives. Right. Earlier in that chapter, just a couple, or maybe it's later, somewhere around there it's also talking about the kinds of burdens that are the daily, kind of just the daily, the daily grind, right? And how those are the kinds of burdens that we're responsible, we're responsible to carry on our own in our relationship with God our Father, with the Lord. But it's these more unusual burdens that we're to be helping each other out with, right? These things that are, that are more uncommon, um, stresses that we didn't expect, uh, relationships with other people in our lives that all of a sudden pose some kind of an issue in front of it that we don't know how to, we're having a hard time dealing with. And it's important for us to rely on each other as a family of God's children. Um, that tight-knit family that we talked about, the unity that's available to us because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us as believers. So this is part of what a family does, this uh, sharing of burdens with one another. But the thing is, our needs are not to be presented with some type of demand or in some way that will be distracting one another from Jesus Christ. That's not the point. Neither are they to be the central focus, our own central focus, of who we are or what controls our lives or what motivates us. Our focus is not to be on our needs, recognizing them, identifying them, and sharing them openly, you know, but not focusing on them, and certainly not placing them as a focus upon Jesus Christ our Savior. He is to be our focus. The Holy Spirit living through us is to be our focus. All right. Had Paul wanted to, Silas or Timothy, had any of them wanted to, they could have used their position as this kind of cloak for selfish ambition or selfish gain. As some modern day preachers, maybe some of you have heard or experienced, uh, there are some preachers in every, in every culture, in, in every time, there are, there are some that, uh, that use some kind of a tactic like that, a cloak of covetousness um, coming under the guise of their position when in reality they're really wanting to try to make money um, or uh, focus on the love of money. You know, that's an example. Now, while there were times in Paul's service, because there's nothing, there's nothing, again, there's nothing wrong with, with this. While there were, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, in this situation with the Thessalonians, he did not accept any, any uh, 
any money from them, for example. Well, that, while there were times in Paul's service to the many churches he visited that he did cheerfully accept support, he hadn't done so from the Thessalonians. It was possibly in order to avoid any kind of questioning or potential distrust in the future. It could have been because the Thessalonians it hadn't occurred to them to offer. It could have been because of his strong personal feeling of Paul's and Timothy's and Silas' personal feeling toward them as a parent. Remember, these men truly engaged with these Thessalonians, these Thessalonian believers, as spiritual fathers. Right? And so it may have been that the reason they didn't accept that kind of support from them was because they wanted to make it clear that the focus was to be on the love that Paul and Silas and Timothy was demonstrating to them through Jesus Christ, all right? And not based on any kind of response or reaction that they could give. Um, in either case, Paul didn't operate in either of these ways mentioned in verse five. He wasn't, he wasn't offering flattery. He wasn't offering some kind of an, uh, an overt or distracting neediness. Uh, neediness. Uh, doing so would have required him to shift, again, to shift the focus away from being able to be bold in Jesus Christ to a focus on his flesh. Right? And it would have drawn a focus in the people away from their ability to focus on Christ and the temptation to be drawn away according to maybe the needs of the flesh that the men had, may or may not have had. Anytime we begin depending on methods of the flesh, right? This is important because we all are tempted to do it. And in one way or another, each one of us, all right, each one of us, to varying degrees, focuses too much on the needs of our flesh, right? Or is distracted by our old nature that was crucified with Christ. Right? Um, when we do that, we walk into a place of confusion. It's a place of darkness. Walking according to the flesh or listening to the old nature that was crucified only brings confusion and darkness. And the scary thing about that, actually, it's good. Uh, what seems scary about that is that it's often so subtle that we don't know it. We can think, we can be operating in the flesh and think that we're being successful in accomplishing this task and that task and this task over here, but if we're doing it in the flesh, we may not know it, but we're being deceived and we're operating out of a place of confusion. All right. As successful as it may appear to be. So Paul wasn't doing this. He wasn't offering, he wasn't walking out of the, he wasn't, um, he wasn't being manipulative. He wasn't being flattering. Um, the Thessalonians knew these things about the missionaries as well. And he said to them, as ye know, in verse five, he used that phrase, as they recalled the time that the missionaries had spent with them, they recalled men who were certainly not filled with flattery, but rather integrity, with consistency, responsibility toward Christ, and men who had a genuine, a genuine fatherly affection for these new believers. And as the genuineness of these men, they could reflect again on the clarity of Jesus' gospel. There was nothing that was standing in their way. They didn't have to try to see past some kind of um, a diversion that Paul, Silas, and Timothy were, were feeding. They didn't have to try to look past that because the men's intentions were pure. And so they knew that the men were pure and what they were saying was trustworthy and they were accountable to God themselves. So Paul wraps up this verse with a phrase in verse five that he uses several times to stress uh, the important point. Uh, verse five and verse six, again, we'll read it. It says, this is again, 1 Thessalonians chapter two. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. This phrase, God is witness, showed again that it was 
not the unbelieving men or women whose witness Paul, Silas, and Timothy were accountable to. Okay? It wasn't the unbelievers that lied all around Thessalonica, but neither was it the Thessalonian believers themselves. Neither was it the new church that was formed. It wasn't so much of them that they were accountable to for this message either. Even though, in a sense, as brothers and sisters in the same family of Christ, we do have an accountability, a sense of accountability to one another. And Paul and Silas and Timothy knew this. But what he's saying here was that he didn't bring this message out of an accountability to them. He brought it out of an accountability to God. God was their witness. <clears throat> if it were brought... Okay, out of a focus of trying to gain popularity or some kind of the Thessalonians, the unbelievers or the believers, it would again impact his focus. The message may have been distorted so that it became maybe a little more palatable to fleshly ears or a little more palatable to old natures that didn't want to believe on Jesus Christ as the sole sacrifice and mediator of us between God and man. Uh, may have been a message that would cause the Thessalonians to focus on the missionaries, on the men themselves, rather than on the message that they brought about Christ. Um, and it would have posed to gain, it could have been posed to gain some kind of glory or personal recognition from the Thessalonians. None of that was what Paul and Silas and, and Timothy were doing. They knew they were accountable to God. God was witness. They recognized their own personal accountability to the source of what it was that they were sharing, the source being God, right? Of everyone, I mean, this is obvious, of, of everyone who would have been able to speak to the message, the validity of the message, uh, and confirm the validity of this message that Paul, Silas, and Timothy were speaking, it was the one that, from whom the message came, which is God himself. Right? God himself, who is already all-knowing, omniscient, all knowing and all places at one time. Every, everywhere that the disciples, everywhere that the missionaries went, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, everywhere they went, he was hearing and watching and, and knew. Of course, he lived inside of them. So he was their witness. He's our witness, too. All right. So far in chapter 2 of this letter, verses 1 to 6, Paul was setting, he was setting the record straight. Would someone turn the air down just a little bit more, please? Um, so far in chapter 2 of this letter, in verses 1 to 6, Paul was setting the record straight, listing the ways that he, Paul himself, and Timothy, and Silas did not behave during their visit with the Thessalonians. Okay? They were talking about these ways that they did not behave during their visit, and then responding to those ways that they did not behave with things that they did do, kind of giving this contrast Look at these things that we didn't do. Now look at these things that we did do. While mixing in with that, you know, some of those as you knows, which helped cement that, and to, like we said, take ownership, help the Thessalonian believers take ownership of what they recalled and what they remembered. Some of the things that he said, just in summary, were in verse 2, Paul and Silas and Timothy had not come in vain. Rather, as the Thessalonians knew, they came in boldness. Verses 3 and 4, they had not come in error or deceit, rather as ones entrusted with the gospel, the gospel of truth. They had not come as to please men, but rather as to please God. Right, so again, they're addressing these. We did not come in this fashion. This was not our intention. Our intention was this. We came in this, this um, comparison, this contrast that he's making. Verse 5, they had not come with flattering words or seeking glory from men, and they had not come with an attitude of neediness in verse 6, though they could have, being actual apostles of Jesus Christ and the authority that that brings, they could have come presenting some kind of a focus of their own neediness, right? but they didn't do that. In verses 7 to 11, Paul makes a little bit of a shift in what he's writing. He turns his attention now to focus only on the ways that they did behave. Right? Without any further mention in these verses about what they did not do. No further mention about how they did not behave. But now it's a focus only on the ways that they did behave. Right? As though he was moving the Thessalonians from uh, or into a more streamlined focus. 
focus. Right? Like, you've heard the rumors. Okay, you've heard the rumors. I've addressed the rumors. I've responded to the rumors. Now it's time to lay them aside and focus on the truth. You've heard the rumors. I've addressed the rumors. Right? I've addressed these lies, these gossiping things that you've heard. Um, and now it's time to move on and focus on the truth. This is a really good practice. Right? This is an example for us. This is a good way that we can apply or respond to situations when we hear, um, or if we hear, any kind of rumors developing in our church, in our body, in our lives, at the workplace, be by confronting them head on. Not spending an or inordinate amount of time looking at them and dissecting them, but it's very easy. The temptation can be, and the temptation for Paul and Silas and Timothy could have been to know that these rumors were going on about them, know that there was gossip taking place, and just kind of been, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't really, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know how to deal with that. Um, you know what, maybe if we just ignore it, it'll just stop. You know? Maybe if we just don't say anything about it, people will forget, and maybe, you know, maybe, you know, no, let's just not do anything about it. Let's just let it go and, and just hope for the best. But he didn't do that. We do that because we feel threatened, maybe, Maybe we're afraid or fearful. Um, when in actuality, addressing them head on, very simply, by simply acknowledging them, rumors, lies, by acknowledging them and clearly but simply setting the record straight, the message straight, is often better, more courageous. It's a more effective way of handling and dispelling the lies. If the lie is out there, you address the lie, you respond to the lie with the truth, and then you move on to it, from it. And suddenly, the power that the flesh, that the old nature, that Satan, the power that can be in those areas of deception has now been dispersed. It's been dispelled because it's been addressed, brought out into the open, and you now have the ability to move on. Ephesians 5.11 says, and do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. Okay, Ephesians 5.11, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. Right? So again, the idea of the rumor being identified, bringing it to light, addressing it, correcting it, and moving on from it. And that's what these men were doing. It then enables the pure truth to be the entire focus. Right. Let's read uh, chapter 2, verses 7 to 11 again. But we were gentle, chapter 2, verse 7, 1 Thessalonians. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also." How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children. Timothy, Paul, and Silas, they were gentle. They were affectionate. They were personally invested in these spiritual sons and daughters of theirs, they were weariless laborers. They worked hard. They were behaving holily, holy. They were just. They were behaving justly and unblameably. They were exhorting, right? They were challenging, encouraging, and they were comforting, right? And they were treating the Thessalonians just like their own children. In verse 7, Paul says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. 
this phrase, this amazed me when I was reading this. The, the life of Paul, when he, when we, I mean, he, had still, he continued with both names, Saul and Paul. Now, he didn't, but we consider the name of Saul more frequently when we think of his old, you know, the life before salvation. When he was out there persecuting believers and leading riot, we consider him called Paul, Saul then, so I'll, I'll make that distinction. Um, when he was called Saul, we look at him and see this picture of this arrogant, this insensitive man whose sole focus in life is to annihilate and get rid of as many believers as he possibly can do. Right? He hates them. And this contrast of what the Holy Spirit has done in his life is remarkable. He says, but we were gentle among you. This phrase, gentle among you, brought with it a picture of loving intimacy and the idea of being surrounded by or being in the center of very similar to a teacher, similar a little bit to a teacher in a classroom, but with a great, much greater deal of intimacy. Right? Kind of like a hen being surrounded by her chicks. You know? It was as though to say, we were found, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, we were found to be gentle in the very midst and center of you believers. There's a commentator by the name of Ironside who puts it this way. It says, Paul looked on the Thessalonian believers, these young believers, who had so recently come to know Christ, because remember, it was only six months ago. He looked on them as his own children in the faith. His own children. He exerted himself in every possible way to build them up in Christ. He took this responsibility seriously. We've talked about that. Paul might have said to his children in the faith, all right, now that you're converted, the least you can do is be concerned about my support. He could have said that. But he would not bring the gospel down to that low level. On many occasions, when he came to the end of his financial resources, he turned to his trade right, to make provisions for himself, which was tent making, in order to provide for himself and his companions. When the saints realized their responsibility and counted it a privilege to care for Paul in other churches, um, he was willing to accept their support, but he never put them to the test. As an apostle of Christ, again, that was a, by a commentator by the name of Ironside, as an apostle of Christ, he could have rightfully requested that his needs be considered. But he didn't do that. In fact, his position toward the Thessalonians was quite the opposite exerting himself in any way and every way toward them that might in some way have benefit to build the, Thes the, the, the Thessalonians up in their faith in Christ. That was his focus. That is what he wanted for them. He wanted their, their fellowship with Christ to be even greater and have this continued, this continued growth about it, a continued growing vibrancy. He continued with the phrase, even as a nurse cherisheth her children, which brings about it an even increased sense of intimacy. Not merely a nurse, not just a nurse, but an actual nursing mother whose tenderness exceeded even that of a, typic of a typical child's father. This unique intimacy in giving of herself, uh, uh, likened unto a mother, a nursing mother, giving of herself fully, without any expectation to be provided something, even the ability to be provided something in return by her baby. Right. That's the kind of intimacy that Paul was referring to here. That's the picture, that's the picture, the, the word picture, I guess, that, that he felt toward these Thessalonian believers. You, know? you can't offer me anything. There's nothing of merit that you can offer me just like you can't offer anything to God the Father to gain some kind of merit. That's not what it's about. It's about the love that God has for you. And Paul was saying, that's what I'm trying to demonstrate 
And that's what I'm compelling you to understand more and more. To know this deep, intimate love that God the Father has toward you that's even closer, even as close as a mother nursing her own baby that can't have anything given to her in return and yet gives everything that she has to this helpless baby. All right. That's the picture that Paul was demonstrating to them. In verse 8, he says, So being affectionately desirous of you, beginning of that verse, he's conveying this ardent longing for a tender loving, and a tender loving. He's going out of his way, again, to convey with as much esteem and intentionality as he could. He's going out of his way to explain the way in which he, Silas, and Timothy cared for these men and women of this church. These spiritual children. As I was reflecting on this level of intimacy, not only that Paul felt, but that he was expressing, it occurred to me, it was occurring to me that only, <laughs> only men, only men whose security is truly found in Christ can talk with this much intimacy. Right. In many societies, in our own society, many societies and cultures today, such tender speech from a man is looked down upon, it's resisted, even shied away from or run from. You know? It's not encouraged. It's not encouraged. Yet Paul voluntarily expressed his deep and tender love in this way. He directly and vulnerably did so to these believers. He had, had his heart been built on selfishness, pride, egotism. It's all another proof. It's all another proof to the Thessalonians that these guys were genuine. You know, they were real. They didn't try to act this way in order to make it look like they were. It couldn't have come across. It, it couldn't have come across more genuine because it was genuine. Had it come from a place of selfishness, pride, egotism, or fear, as they had once been, as unbelievers, as Saul had once been, um, they'd have not had the ability to, or the grounding to express it. But now, the fact that they were resting in this peace, the fact that Paul and Silas and Timothy, that they were resting in this peace in Christ, and knowing, intimately knowing and uh, fellowshipping with Christ, abiding with him themselves, and understanding this deep level of intimacy themselves, they understood that for themselves there was nothing they had to fear. You know? They didn't need to be concerned about reactions. Right? They were responsible to God, who was their witness. If his readers... If, if, Paul, if these men's readers, his sons and daughters in Christ, if they had needed to read any kinds of such expressions of tenderness, he was glad and happy to express it to them directly, without any kind of reservation and without any kind of shame. This is another reason for you and I to be so focused on abiding in our fellowship with Christ with each one of this that looks a little bit different. You know? Tracy gave some examples earlier. With each one of us, it looks a little bit different because we're unique people. But understanding that it's not some disjointed practice throughout the day. It's not a, a time period of devotions. It's not a, okay, I'm going to take a break now from everything else I'm doing and go and read this. Or, okay, now I'm going to take a break from this and I'm going to go over here and pray. I mean, all those things are important. They might be involved in it, but it's this ongoing ebb and it's this ongoing flow understanding this relationship that we have because of that relationship this opportunity to be abiding and have this kind of fellowship with Christ all throughout our day going to him and talking with him about things that are going on it's that kind of thing that produces the peace that produces the joy those fruits of the spirit that come out from us and it's those kinds of things that free us up to live lives of abundance and fullness 
free us up to be able to express this kind of love and intimacy that God has for one another. Folks, as, as, as you know, Tracy and I are, we're, on a personal note, we're, we're putting our house up for sale and with the intention of moving and returning back to Pennsylvania. You will have another pastor here, right? right? You'll be led by someone here who is, who is called by God to guard you, from lies and deception, and to guide you in Scripture, in truth. As you're looking for someone to fill this spot on a permanent basis, or however long that permanent basis looks like, as you're looking for someone, be looking for kinds of character qualities like this. You know, a man who, has, who ha understands what it means to have the Holy Spirit living inside of them, and who values that to the point where he is demonstrating this kind of love and compassion and nurture. You know? Every man is different. Everyone is, everyone is different. Everybody carries out and has, and the Lord uses each individual man to, to uh, just like women, you know, to carry out uh, and focus on different strengths and different things. So none of us knows what that's going to look like yet in your new pastor, but I want to implore you, encourage you, exhort you to be mindful and be very intentional, intentional in your praying and in your seeking for someone to fill this spot, looking for someone who values their time of fellowship that they have with the Lord in a way that you see the Holy Spirit's character qualities these fruit coming out from them, lived through them, right? Now let's close in prayer. Father God, I thank you again for the example of Paul and Silas and Timothy. Thank you, Lord, that every time we read your word, that there are always new things, because it's a living word. The word uh, of Christ, uh, of Jesus himself. Um, it's a living word. That every time we read it, Lord, there are new things, um, new things that you want to show us. Uh, maybe a fact maybe a new fact that we haven't seen before, or it may be something that you want to reveal to us in our fellowship, in our abiding with you that we haven't seen before. But Father, be teaching us throughout this week, causing us to be sensitive in a couple different areas. One, being sensitive to your Holy Spirit, pricking us and showing us different areas in our lives where we allow the old nature to get in the way of the truth of your word. Or maybe where we allow the words of someone else to get in the way of the truths of your word and the truths of your fellowship with us. And Father, also be bringing the church to a place of sensitivity, intentionality, and discernment about the man whom you will have to lead this church as their pastor, the one who will be charged to guard and guide them and to help to equip them through your Holy Spirit. Father, we need you. And our lives are insufficient and built on places of confusion if we live lives that are mixed we never walk lives perfectly, and they're always going to be mixed, Father. But if we are choosing to focus our lives on our flesh or on our old nature, God, then we will be walking in places of confusion and deception. And many times in making that decision, many times 
we won't even see the deception that we are walking in until you bring us to a place in your sanctification process that corrects us and teaches us and trains us. Father, help us to be teachable. And cause us to want to learn. And cause us to value the relationship that we have with you as sons and daughters who believe on your son, Jesus Christ, as the only way, the only method of salvation. And Father, we pray these things in the power of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, you're dismissed. Oh, we do have, we're not dismissed yet. We have.